So next on the tour is the Sanctum Hotel. We're just about to pull up to it now. We're gonna meet Mark Fuller, who's an old friend of mine, and he's one of the most interesting characters in the business. And we're gonna find out how the Sanctum Hotel has adapted since lockdown. Mark Fuller, how are you? I'm all right, mate. Thanks for coming on Posh Cockney TV. You're very welcome. It's good to be in Sanctum. I've uh, spent many a night on here, as you, you know. You have, haven't you? I think I might still have a bill or two for you. I think, <laughs> I, I think my car's going to be meeting me outside yes, right, very quickly. Exactly, yeah, we've got declined. Uh, but there you go. So how um, are you? So lo lockdown's well, lifted. So. Lockdown's lifted. Um, it's still a tough one. It's going to be a tough one for the industry. It's, um, you know, when we did the Soho Festival, which has been very successful, um, and it shows it very much so because we're in Warwick Street, West Soho, one step off Regent Street. We're a hotel, so we, we've got 30 rooms. We're a bit crazy, so we don't have your regular people staying, yeah. uh, thankfully, because there's no regular people around. Yeah. Uh, so we have the more eclectic uh, people that like to stay in Soho. Um, they didn't understand during uh, the lockdown that the essential stay didn't mean that you could empty the minibar. <laughs> um, but uh, now they're very happily emptying the minibar. Um, yeah. We've had to make some big changes. Obviously, you know, you've got the social distancing thing checking in. We've got a very famous hot tub on the roof. Is it, in, is it in play? It, it's in play. Great. Uh, but we're obviously making sure that uh, people, individual rooms use it and then they have to wait and you have to book and everything else. Uh, the famous rooftop uh, residence bar that was normally open 24 hours, we don't open. Yeah. Uh, we open until one o'clock in the morning because uh, there's no nightclubs open yeah. and I don't really want to be a nightclub no. uh, and I think people are clearly looking for other things to do you know the nightclub industry I don't think you'll come back until next year uh, so you know I, I want to maintain the social stance uh, within Soho mm -hmm. that we support the Soho festival so probably out of the 10-15 rooms we're about 40-50% uh, this weekend the majority of people are going to the Soho festival mm -hmm. and after a bit of a, a, a rocky start as far as people's perception and you know people forgetting that we're in the middle of a pandemic yeah it had a uh, bit of bad press that first well it, well it did but you know what i've just come from a meeting with the council right and they're really happy because what's morphed it instead of it growing into the first night which it, it had the potential to do what happened is is it we, we had the first day and i really i was really stunned with the amount of people that came mm. there because literally if you walk up wardour street and you turn into West Soho, you're walking from liveliness into a ghost town. Yeah. We're standing here in Warwick Street. pret a manger is now shut at two o'clock in the afternoon. Well, they stay open for anything. Yeah. Right, okay, there's nobody in this area. And the only people that we have in this hotel are people in for business mm -hmm. or people going to the festival. Um, and there's very little action. If you go on Oxford Street or Regent Street, lots of shops closed, lots, you know, there's lots of shops boarded up, your mangoes and all that sort of stuff, TJ Lewin. That must be worrying It's you. very worrying. Uh, there's no offices back at all. Mm. So um, as I said, I've just come from the, um, the Soho uh, Festival Committee, as, as it were, run by my great friend Victor Garvey, who's got an amazing restaurant called Solar. Um, and the reality is, is everyone's saying the same thing. There's no lunch business. There's no business Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. But because of the Soho Festival, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, it's amazing. It now, it now resembles a balmy Parisian street yeah. with a bit of fun going on. Uh, we we, we recognise that on the uh, first time, these are say the people going to the shops, getting takeaways and everything else, you know, and then sitting in the middle of the street did not help. So uh, the, the group have voluntarily offered up to the council, which is amazing that they only will do uh, no takeaways. We've asked all the off licences to shut in the afternoons, which you know, my argument with the off license is, is yes, we're taking something away from you. Yeah. But if there was nobody in the area, you wouldn't be selling any Mars bars, yeah. you yeah. know? So they're quite happy with it. The council think it's a super idea. But you know what, one of the most amazing thing that's happened there, I, I've, I've been in Soho, um, oh blimey, uh, certainly 35, if not 40 years. And at the beginning of Soho, when, when we were there, when it was sort of half a sex area, um, and certainly a, a, a not as salubrious as it is now, um, we all knew each other. Yeah. Whether we liked each other or not was a different point. Yeah. Right. But we all knew each other and everything else. And that over the years, okay, I haven't been in Soho, but it kind of, even though there's lots and the, and the whole point about John James's thing was that um, they're all individual operators. 
and these individual operators, because of the whole PC corporate thing and chain thing and all everybody that opens a restaurant thinks it's gonna be a chain and everything else, we all started working individually. Yeah. And what's happened is, is that 50, 60, 70, maybe even 100 businesses have all come together and we're all talking. Mm -hmm. And I love it because I think it's great. I'm a hotel. I'm outside Soho. I actually didn't know anybody in Soho bar one or two people. Mm -hmm. And now I know everybody. And we all talk to each other. We all had a, 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 there was not one, in an hour and a half meeting, there was not one disagreement. We're all working together. And I turned around to the council and I said, listen, what John James has achieved here is to put us all together mm -hmm. as one vocal group of businesses in one very, very special area. And we speak as one and this council guy, he said, yeah, it's blown our minds. He said, we thought we were gonna have to deal with a hundred different Arseholes, basically, um, you know, and and it, but but suddenly we're all talking as one. And do, you th do you think that will carry on though? I really do. Yeah, I think it's a real change. I think the world has to change anyway, mm -hmm. right? I think that there's more consideration, or at least there should be, and I think we've started it. But you look outside Soho, there's nothing going on. No, I mean yes, there's business on the on you know on a sunny night on the Thames. Yes, the pubs in Chiswick are busy. Yes. The high streets in Hammersmith are busy and all the bits and pieces. But the reality is, is if you, if you want to find a social hub, there isn't one mm -hmm. apart from Soho. And currently, it isn't really there except for Wednesday through. But it's quite nice on Monday and Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. We've been out there on Monday and Tuesdays. And, you know, I was talking to the guys there and I'm saying, listen, how's it been for you? I said, because you, I said, you know, look at my hotel. You know, our bars are open, our restaurants are open, but there's nobody here, mm -hmm. right? The hotel rooms are busy or busy-ish, not as busy as they were but there's nobody here because there's no social activity. It's more business levels, people coming on stage and going into the Soho Festival. Yeah. So there was a very good guy um, uh, on the TV last night and he said, this is the difference between us being here in September. We, we, we mustn't get this, we, we can't think for a minute that the people in Soho are making any money mm -hmm. because they're probably not. Some are doing better than others, but the reality is, is this is the difference for these operators being here in September to have a fighting chance of survival rather than going under now. You Do you know? think you'll be here in September? Oh yeah. yeah. We're a hotel. We can survive. Mm. Here's the interesting thing in life. Hotels are gonna be okay because you always need to stay somewhere. Yeah. Right, doesn't matter where you are, you'd be a little bit worried if you were you know, a, a nice hotel in Cornwall that only has a six month period where you can take your customers. So you're gonna have to write off this year. Um, but you are, but they, but they are getting support, not necessarily from the, but you know, from from the local councils and everything. Um, but I think hotels certainly. This is what, like you asked me, am I going to survive? Well, yeah. The bottom line is, is that our, my only concern as a hotel is if all the big brands open up and offer ridiculous deals. Yeah. Because you know, if you're being offered a penthouse in the in the Mayfair for the same price as one of my rooms, as much as you love me, you're probably going there. I was going to ask you about your pricing. Have you had to adjust that at all? We have a little bit, yeah. but we're only little and we, and, and we still offer that. We, 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 we offer a pared down version of what we do, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, the Karma Sanctum Soho is really a hotel, come restaurant, come bar, come members club, come nightclub, come music venue, everything. Very tongue in cheek and we're, and, and, and we're, and we're quite, you know, quite rock and roll. Uh, so it, I think that, you know, we offer something a little bit different. You know, and during the, um, the, sh the, the the lockdown, we had essential stays, and one of the essential stays was a quite famous musician. Okay. Who, uh, who I, I don't want to mention, but um, uh, uh, you know, we said just just wander around. It's like The Shining. Mm. So we come in, and there he'd be behind the bar getting his own ice. And <laughs> there he'd be in the kitchen cooking up his own dinner and everything else. I had to give him a deal, uh, but um, you know everything else. So we've gone back to um, I, I, before before lockdown. I hit a, a very interesting formula. We have six or seven types of rooms. When we first built the hotel, or when I first built the hotel, we had small rooms, which we now call compact rooms, but these people crash pads. I built those, one, because I couldn't think of what else to do with it. A tiny little room, mm -hmm. you can't swing a cat, you get a bed in, a mini bar, and a shower. And we offered them out relatively cheap, and that those are the rooms um, for people like, friends of, of mine like you, they were marked, do us a favor rooms. I can't make it home. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I believe your name is on a couple of those. Uh, but um, you know, um, cheap, cheerful, yeah. you know, come in, get your head down, wake up with your sticky mouth, wash it off um, and, um, and, and then head out. And then we have superior rooms, which are nice, 
decently priced ones and then you go up to the deluxe rooms which are quite smart yeah um it, it's still in a boutique so they're, they're nowhere near as big as some other hotel rooms and then you go to my most popular junior suites with the bars in the middle of the rooms and the Swarovski crystals and everything else before lockdown what i thought was i thought hang on what we were generally doing is selling a lot of the lower category rooms and then when because we weren't selling any of the higher rooms much because frankly there were amazing deals out there because let's face it the industry both in restaurants bars and hotels was not great at the beginning of this mm. year maybe it's because everyone was expecting this maybe it was brexit it was all of it there was lots right? going on lots going on yeah so in, so I, I i hit on a formula where actually let's call a spade a spade and i i, I kept my lower room prices relatively high and i reduced my suite prices to something because there are best rooms and there are best memories yeah and hotels are made of memories of course so I thought, why am I trying to go into competition with all the other big hotels that are offering these amazing suites and everything else? Yeah. Let's just treat my suites as normal price rooms and my smaller rooms as the favor rooms. And it was massively successful. So what I've done actually now, the, the only parameter that I've done now is I've gone actually, I'm gonna look at what people need and my smaller rooms, which because there's no business going on and there's no tourism going on and there's no requirement, are really need, needful rooms. Mm -hmm. So I've reduced those rooms down to a real decent price. And I've kept the suites at the same price because I've got to make money. Mark, let's talk about hospitality. Mm -hmm. What does hospitality mean to you? Well, that's a very interesting point because it, 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 the reality of what's happening now has uh, reignited my thoughts and perception of hospitality. You know, when we first started, when you were a promoter and I was a fat club owner rather than a fat hotelier um, the um, you know the perception was it was all about the vibe and it was all about beyond is Beyonce coming tonight and it was all about wow that was a great night and you know you finish on the night and you've got home and you get absolutely wasted and you wake up in the morning and the world you're in this funny little nightclub bubble yeah um, and that was all, all that it just seemed to be what it was all about mm -hmm. Right, okay. Um, and then you move on and you get a bit older and everything else. And then it becomes a whole corporate thing because, you know, in nightclub and hotels and everything else, you don't forget, you know, I was in business with Marco Pierre White for a long time, um, who's a very passionate chef, amazing chef, uh, Gary Hollyhead, Luke Thomas, yeah. um, you know, and, and there was a passion about food. But everything until, you know, then the world got taken over by TV chefs and everything else. Um, and uh, the, the bottom line is it became all very corporate. And it all became about the money and it all became about who's got the Ferrari and everything else. What has happened now is, in my view, is that hospitality has become exactly what it says on the tin. Mm. We now, as hospitaliers or whatever you call us, um, hosp the hospitality industry, now need to deliver to the customer what they want within reason. Pre-COVID, you could go into a restaurant and said, say, uh, or a hotel and say yeah I want the bed turned upside down I want pink sheets I want you know uh, pink ice cubes and you'd have to do it right to just keep the business um, if you phoned up at four o'clock morning and saw an egg sandwich you'd have to have it you know um, and everybody got everything what they want with largesse and asking for deals uh, now the public has respected I uh, will, will respect what's going on with us because they can see that it's there and we in turn our largesse has has turned to gratitude and the customer's gonna get a better deal and we're gonna enjoy ourselves more because I think the hospitality business has to go back to doing what it says on the tin. Where did the creative inspiration for Sanctum come from? Well, it was a very easy one, actually. It was back in the day. I mean, I, I uh, as you know, my history was Sugar Reef, Fred Cube. I sold them. I had the Embassy Club. I went into business with um, a uh, very amusing gentleman called Andy Taylor, who was at that point the head of the Sanctuary Music Group. Um, and they managed, agented, and looked after pretty much every major artist, you know, from Iron Maiden to Guns N' Roses to uh, Beyonce to Elton John to Destiny's Child to, I mean, you name it, they looked mm -hmm. after, mostly in the rock industry and everything. Um, and my great friend Rod Smallwood, who manages Iron Maiden, um, he said to me, in 35 years of touring, he said, never once have I ever found a hotel that told the truth. Um, and when I leave, in my fancy blacked out van for this massive concert that they're still amazingly big doing. Um, he said, I would say, is the bar open? Uh, and of course the concerts generally finish, you know, 11, yeah. 11 30 by the time you get out the venue. And he said nine and a half times out of 10, he would appear back into his hotel 
with an entourage, whether it be LA, whether it be Mexico, whether it be London, whether it be Wolverhampton. Um, not sure they've ever played Wolverhampton. Uh, but um, <laughs> I have to check but, that yeah, one. check if there's a venue big enough. Uh, but um, uh, but you know, and and that there was nowhere really for the band and and Rod and his friends to relax and everything else, because what they actually meant was that there may be a man doing the hoovering that could go behind the bar and bring you a gin and tonic without ice because you've got any ice left mm -hmm. with the lights up. And, I, and I've seen it myself and, you know, a couple of times on some of the big gigs and everything, I have the title of chief bottle uh, opener with them and I it's go and open name. a few bottles. Yeah. Um, and um, so, you know, and it, and it, 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 it's right. And the same thing applied when I got involved in the festivals. I mean, I did 16 years in Hyde Park. Uh, for the festivals and the reality is, is they used to call hospitality hostility mm. right because everybody wanted something that they didn't yeah. want to pay for yeah. um and um so you know so the, the the reason for this hotel was okay let's do a hotel that says what it actually does if we're going to do a music business hotel and by the nature of the fact of you know rod and andy were my partners i was 16 years in hyde park i've been in and around the music industry i've never been a well, I was a manager for a bit. I was really crap back in the 80s, um, but certainly never managed anything or, or anything. But these are two of the greatest managers known to mankind of that era with a lot of the most famous artists. Let's create something that isn't the hard rock cafe. So it's not a music business hotel that you go and you see guitar. Although we did have a charity guitar hanging by the bar recently. Um, it's a, it's a, a hotel in central London built with musicians in mind. You know, because uh, and therefore you have a rock and roll lifestyle. Now the reality is, is that live music is the biggest earner now. So the days of turning up in a hotel, you know, uh, ordering 14 bags of Quaaludes and four tons of cocaine, and uh, you know, and um, you know, smashing up your hotel room, don't exist because no. you know they might come back and have a couple of bevies and hit hit the bed, mm -hmm. right? Because they're up at eight o'clock in the morning and doing all you know and, and and working again. So the main criteria for my hotel that we've got five floors. We have the rooftop bar, which as I say is normally open 24 hours, not just at the moment. Uh, we have the ground floor restaurant where we are now, the cinema in the basin where a lot of bands also rehearse. Right. Um, and therefore we have uh, five, five floors of rooms and it depends how basically we gradate the bands as to how, how much you want to sleep. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a few lively ones, they're on the top floor because yeah. they can wander up and down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And the other Direct ones... Direct access to the rooftop bar Yeah, exactly. Well. Yeah. But the bottom line is, is that the, the general comment that I get from most bands that come and go aren't the beds so comfortable? <laughs> Not, we ran out of Jack Daniels, yeah. you know what I mean? So that was the criteria behind the Rock and Roll Hotel, where you could get great food. Strangely as well, the whole vegetarian vegan thing. Um, you know, I got involved with Chrissy Hine from The Pretenders recently, where we've done her menu. Um, and that's a big thing now, because a lot of people are very health conscious in the music industry because they've got to work. Mm -hmm. So we've got this really tongue in cheek thing where, you know, it's a Rock and Roll Hotel. The reality is, is that the rock bands are the least badly behaved. Um, it's the uh, sportsmen. We have a lot of rugby stars coming here, yeah. I shall mention none, yeah. um, that come here and they, they still know how to really enjoy themselves and they're generally the last ones out the bar, but then that's also almost tr tradition. Um, so we built this rock and roll hotel and the whole point about it is it's a rock and roll lifestyle. So when you ring down at four o'clock in the morning and say, can I have a bottle of Jack Daniels and four Cokes? We just deliver it. We, you know, we ask them how many glasses. We don't yeah. go, oh, I'm sorry, sir, it's four o'clock. Um, you know, when you want to come back with you know, 10 of your best friends and go and sit on the roof, no problem, right? You know, if you, we built all the rooms so ridiculously soundproofed. The only issue we have is most people complain they can't hear room service knock on the door. Having a rock and roll hotel, do you encourage naughtiness then? Well, I think you should always encourage naughtiness, shouldn't you? <laughs> I think it's, that's what life goes on, yeah, right? Sure. You know, I always say as long as it's vaguely legal, it's okay by me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, listen, it's, of course, you got to listen, you, uh, you know, again, in this climate, we have noted, we, well, there's one thing that's absolutely for sure. This life is no dress rehearsal. Yeah. This moment that is passing between us, strangely will repeat itself because we're being filmed, but in general, it won't, <laughs> right? Okay, it doesn't for you and me, for a lot of other people it will. Yeah. Um, and, and you should live your life and you should enjoy your life, yeah. right? I mean, I have a rule. If you, if you misbehave or you piss me or my staff off, and there's a lot about respect to my staff as well, because they're the ones that get it at four o'clock in the morning, not me, I'm sleeping, yeah. Yeah. right, okay? If you can wake up in the morning and say, I was a twat, I'm sorry, you can come back. Yeah. If you can't, you've got to go. Yeah, or if sure. you repeat it again, you've got to go. Because yeah. again, I have a respect for my staff and I have respect for what I do. And I have a respect for my other guests. Yeah. You know? So yeah, naughtiness, no problem. Right? You know, hotels are traditionally places where you generally aren't with your own wife, um, where you are generally out having fun. Yeah. You know, if you think again, back in the day, 
there were no nightclubs and there were no restaurants or bars that you could particularly have. You had a few, you know, a late night lock in somewhere. All sorts of activities went on in hotels. Yeah. You know, and they probably st and they and they still do. Mm -hmm. Maybe we are the new nightclub. 